what I, what I, I should have said was, we don't necessarily want you or anyone else controlling our thought process. Rather, than if we control people. your brains, we control your thoughts. <laughs> then he can make you want. Is that good? <laughs> I think it's excellent. Yeah, I understand stuff. There's a World Health Report was published end of the um, last century, predicting what the major diseases were going to be affecting the world. And number three is major depression. Not in terms of killing people, but certainly on their lifestyle and their morbidity. So all the downstream consequences of being depressed makes you more likely to get diseases, means you're more likely to die from other things and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a major, major health problem. And then the question is how do you actually go about improving that situation and what approaches do you have? So the way in which we try to understand how brains produce illness, how brains produce behaviour, is at the level of the circuits within them. And whereas in the past people had ideas about a bad thing happening in due, so a Sigmund Freud type analysis of brain function would be due to some experience you had. And more recently we've been using genetic approaches to understand what might predispose you to an illness. What we're trying now to do is say that these problems arise from brain activity. So let me take an example. We've done some genetic work where we think that uh, a set of genes involved in actin depolarization is involved in uh, emotion. And so it's not clear why something as basic as that would be involved in the brain in emotional regulation. So we actually thought, well, could we find it in flies? So this is so basic, would you find it in a fly brain? You do find it in the fly brain, the fly has this particular uh, gene, has this particular enzyme. So then we just have to test uh, whether the fly gets a bit upset if we manipulate that part of its cellular structure. And we can do that in flies, whereas we couldn't do that in, 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 in humans, and it's very difficult to do it in, in mammals, but cheap and easy relatively to do it in flies. So we do that manipulation, and lo and behold, we find an expected change. So you'll see in a moment two flies. In one fly, we've genetically engineered the neurons that make it fly, so that when we turn a laser light on, the fly will fly away, while its mate, who does not have light-responsive neurons, will stay behind. So watch for the flash of light. So this works well in flies, where the light can get into the brain, but not so well in mammals, because we have a skull. So there you've moved from thinking about a problem on a rather global scale, have an insight into whether it's a structural or functional process that might be conserved, and then test that hypothesis directly in a, in, a, in a model organism. So you need those resources to answer these questions. We're going to have you grab the chairs, move yourselves close enough to the board to really be part of the conversation. No one, Speak up. There can be no one who doesn't have a certain degree of discomfort. Um, most of the people here are supportive of all advances in technology. We're not you know, uh, trying to, to, to stop uh, learning. But you must confront this uh, on a daily or at least monthly basis. So we want to control brains. Our problem is that brains don't want to be controlled. So we have to overcome this barrier that brains have inherently that, we, that they can't be controlled. No, we definitely want to control brains. <laughs> what I've given you is a totally overblown description of what's possible. At the moment, you got that. So at the moment, all we can do is make a mouse run around, and that's about as best as it gets. No, it's a little bit better. We can, we can make him go to sleep. So you can put a, a, a light into a part of the brain, and then it'll fall asleep, and it'll, it'll wake up. But in order to do anything more sophisticated than that, I mean, it's just, we're at the very, very beginning. So I've got that initial problem, and then I've got the problem that the biology is horrendously complicated, that we only know a fraction of what's going on in brains. We don't really know how they work, they don't know how they produce feelings. And without knowing that information, how can, how can I understand what's going wrong in somebody's brain? So put those things together and you have one of the most challenging problems in biology.